Shabbat Shalom, Sen Bet Salam, Ene Rasia Dinos This is your brother Wendem Yadon, and once again, um, Sen Bet Salam, Sabbath to call peace. This is the 42nd, 42nd Sabbath in our lunar solar Hebraic calendar of uh, Orit. Um, Minbab or Torah, Torah portion readings of the 42nd. It's called in the Hebrew, it's called Matot. Matot, which means in the Hebrew tribes, it's the fifth word, the first distinctive word in the in the Torah portion of the Parsha, in the Hebrew Parsha. Bamarinya and Demhark, we say Kufal, or the the reading portion for this week's this um, Sabbath's reading in the Amharic. If you follow our chart, it is on page six. It is the forty-second, and it's called Negadoch. Negadoch, and the portion, the particular portion, is this is the ninth reading in the Book of Numbers. We got one more um, in the coming week. Um, and this particular season time is connected with uh, Tisha B'Av, which is the ninth of um, the month of Av, or Av, in the Ashkenazi pronunciation is Av, we would say Av. Be that as it may, the ninth of, the ninth of um, Av, in the ninth of the month of Av, the first temple, I think, in 586, and the second temple in uh, 70 A.D. was destroyed um, by um, the enemies of the Beit Israel, first uh, by the Syrio Babylonians. Babylon destroyed it. The people, the tribes, went into captivity. Then there was a remnant that returned to the land, and this is very important to understand the connection with the land and those who have been following these um teachings of his majesty containing the Amharic reading and study of the Met of Kedus, the Bible as well as who are interested in the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated and the land grant, the Shashimani land grant, it's very important to understand the connection between this um teaching, as his majesty said the Bible is written for our instruction. You understand? And it coincides with that scriptural New Testament word speaking that the Bible is written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. So we're living in these times of the so-called last days. And we can clearly see from many different um, points of view and perspectives that we're living in a time unlike any other time. But for us, this reading is important. And in the annual Hebrew um, cycle of Torah readings, it's the ninth in the book of Numbers, and it coincides also with Tisha B'Av, which is the ninth of the month of Ab, to commemorate the destruction of the temple of, of Solomon's temple, the first temple of Solomon. But we know by this time when Solomon's temple was destroyed around 586, there was already a remnant in the holy mountains of Cush or Ethiopia or Ethiopia, um, the son of the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of Sheba, and King Solomon of Israel at Jerusalem. So this is the remnant that we get to learn about later on in the New Testament. If there was not a remnant left to us, we would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. So this reading constitutes Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, to Numbers chapter 32, verse 42. And, and Hebrews, we as black Jews and other, other Jews as well in the diaspora, who are orthodox in that sense, generally read this portion in July or early August. July or early August. Now, some combine this particular Torah portion, the 42nd, they combine it with the next um, kufl, the next portion um, in um, 43, which is called Masay. Masay. Bamarinya in the Amharic we call the forty the forty third actually coming up Guzo, which is Masse, which means the journey, speaking of the journey coming up. So there are we have to understand this, the, the the calendar. The calendar is very important. We have a lunar solar, some say solar lunar calendar or or Hebrew Ethiopian or Ethiopian solar Hebrew lunar calendar that contains up to 55 weeks, and the exact number of these weeks, 
they vary between 50 in common years and 54 or 55 in leap years. Now, in leap years, for example, 2011, this is a, a leap year, and 2014 will be a leap year. So the the kufl named Guzo or the Padasha named Matot in the Hebrew is read separately. Is read separately in the leap year time because there's more weeks to read it. But now in common years, for example, 2010, 2012, 2013, 2015, 2017, and 2018, the Kufal Guzo or, or Parasha Matot is combined with the the uh, the next the next Parasha. Now let me just check this right here for a moment. I think I, I had said. Um, in the last part, let me read that. Read this part over again about the leap years. And the leap years, 2011, this year is a leap year, and 2014 will be a leap year. So it will be the Padasha Matot, which corresponds in the Ethiopic to the Kufal, the Kufal Negadoch tribes, is read separately. Is read separately. So this portion is read separately. But in common years, speaking of 2010 last year, 2012 next year, 2013, the year after 2015, um, 2017, 2018, the, 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 the Kufal or the Kufale, the, the, the portion that is named Negadoch or the Padasha Matot is combined with the next Kufal in the Amharic named Guzo and the Hebrew named Mase, speaking of the journey to help achieve the number of weekly readings um, needed. So that is, that's an important point. It's a very important point, especially as we come out of, as we come out of Babylon and we have to live in, in community you understand, to understand what is the order, very important, the order of our community. So what you should be looking at right now is, the, is a picture of um, the current day um, Jal'ad, Jal'ad or the Gilead, the Gilead, the hills of, of Gilead. And um, you can see there's a very orderly um, agri agricultural um, administration of the land that's in view right there. And this is a real major hint hint to us as we look at Ethiopia, Ethiopia, and Shashimani, and in particular our members who are Federation, Ethiopian World Federation, but of the line of Judah members of this society as well, which teaches the divine heritage, which is which is the core for a sustainable Ethiopian World Federation. So what we're doing is not focusing on the political first, but focusing on the spiritual, focusing on the core elements and the ingredients, you understand, which comprise our divine heritage. This is what the preamble of the Ethiopian World Federation Constitution speaks about. And if you cannot define the divine heritage within its true interpretation and its proper application, especially for us today, then one is not really qualified and one's um, works or lack thereof will uh, verify that. So, so we all should be recognizing the important um, responsibility that we have in faith to labor, but first to learn, first to be teachable. So let's break down the summary of this um, 42nd um, Torah reading that we know in the Amharic as Negadoch and in the Hebrew at Matot, or one we could say Matoch, Negadoch and Matoch. The summary is first it deals with vows, then there's a vengeance on um uh, the Median, the Median, and then there's a cleansing after that battle. Then there's a, there's a dividing of the booty or the the murko, the the murko, the, the 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 spoils of 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 war, and something very interesting that I think connects with the present situation of the Federation, the present situation of the land grant. And I put a little asterisk here, and I will hope that the Dekamezamorit, the disciples, and those who are under discipleship in the society would study this particular um, connection with the land grant, the fifth part, as we break this down into five parts right here, this particular 40 se 42nd reading. The land for the Reubenites and the Gadites. There's land for the Reubenites and the Gadites. Now, summary, first of all, is on vows. 
Moses, he, he tells the heads of the of the Beit Israel tribes, um, Yahweh's command, Jah's command about the Si'let or the Nadarim, which are commitments, commonly they're translated or perhaps we could say mistranslated as vows, that what are Jah's commandments about when one makes a vow? Um, that if a man, and this is from Numbers uh, 30 and 2, if a man made a vow to Jah or to God, the true God, he was to carry out all that he promised. If a girl or a, a, a sister living in her, her father's household, and this is key, if a, if a girl is living in her father's household, made a vow to Jah or assumed an obligation and her father learned of it and did not object, then her vow would stand. But if her father objected on the day that he learned of it, her vow would not stand, and Jah would be able to forgive her for not fulfilling what she had promised by the vow that she had made. Now, if she was married while her vow was still in force and her husband learned of it and did not object on the day that he found out, her vow would stand. But if her husband objected on the day that he learned of it, her vow would not stand, and Jah would forgive her. The vow of a widow or divorced woman was binding. So a woman who is widowed or divorced, in that sense, whatever she vows, it's, it's binding. And it's very in, important, even for conscience' sake, to understand the role of these vows. And sometimes we do not understand what we get into and we suffer thereby, but it's important for us to, to learn this and to teach it to our children. But um, continuing forward, it says, um, it says uh, if a married woman made a vow now, on the other hand, right, and her husband or for purposes today, her king man learned of it and did not object, then her vow would stand. But if her king man or her husband objected on the day that he learned of what she vowed, her vow would not stand and God would forgive her because there's an order. There's an order even, and we're speaking about community, you understand, and this is important for us to find out whether you're in or whether you're out. Because some people are still on the fence. Are you in or are you out? Now, if her husband or her king man annulled one of her vows, if her husband or her king man annulled one of her vows, after the day that he learned of it, he would bear her guilt. He would have to bear her guilt. So we have to look at this, because some would say, well, can't the, the woman she have a right to do such and such? Well, then either that means you're out of this community that you're in Babylon. But if you're in this community, these are, these are the rules and these are the instructions. Now, the next portion of this Torah reading, this is a brief summary, and as we have time, we'll try to get into whatever details that we can. The next part is about the vengeance on Median. Remember from last week's reading, we didn't get to post up all that we had taught on um, the 41st um, um, Torah portion, the Kufale, known as uh, Phinehas, or, or Phineas, or Pinchas, fin, Pinchas, Pinchas, you understand, or Phinehas. We didn't go into all of it, but if you've done your due diligence and studied this, you would recognize that, that Yahweh had directed Musa to attack the Medianites. Now, the Medianites have a very interesting relationship. Um, we can say love in former times with uh, Zipporah, her, her father, who was uh, Moses' uh, father-in-law, called Jethro in one place and Hobab in the next place. Um, they were on good relationships, but something is changing. What was happening in the Beta Israel time is like what's happening in our present time. We look at Africa, the Middle East, even America. There's a whole changing of the guard. Things are changing. We're in a time of change, and they were in a time of change as well in this particular time. But Yahweh had directed Musa to attack the um, Medianites, and after this, he would die. After this, Moses would die. Numbers 31, 1 to 2. Now, at Musa's direction, but we have to remember in the 41st, he already appointed his successor. You understand? Um, he already appointed his successor, uh, Shu, or Yeshua. You understand? Moses already had appointed his successor. My Shu had appointed Shu to be his successor. Now, at Moses' direction, a thousand men of each tribe with um, Phinehas or Phineas, 
son of Eliazar or El Osar, serving as priests on the campaign with the sacred utensils and trumpets, attacked the Median, attacked the Medianites, attacked Median, and slew every man, including five kings of Median, and the prophet Belaam was slain as well. So we now have the vengeance on Median for sending out their holes. They sent out their holes. They sent out their little, their little bitch girls, uh, sorceresses, and the rest of them, Sim- similar to what's going on in this present time, but to basically um, disorientate the Beit Israel um, men, the males of the Beit Israel, because Bela'am, as you recall, in the 40th reading, um, known as Balak, um, Balak wanted to curse the Beit Israel, and he got a, a shaman, a, a witch doctor, a, a pseudo prophet of, of those days and time. You understand? To basically, um, some could say an obia man to, to to curse the Beit Israel. He could not, and he basically did what Yahweh told him to bless Israel instead. But then he gave Balak instruction: these people, you cannot curse them. You understand? But what you can do is corrupt them. And and they sent the Medianites, who were the allies of the Moabites, sent out their woman, you understand, sent out their woman basically to um, invite these uh, these Rasta men, no, these uh, Beta Israel, I'm putting in that way so you can get it in this present time, invite them to the dance, invite them to the club. They went out to the club. But little did the Beta Israel Wendoch know that this club was actually a heathenist um was actually a temple that the clubs back in those times, like today, the clubs, you're going out to the club just hanging out, you, you, you know, and you don't recognize that you're participating in a, a in worship, in worship activity of false gods. You understand? And a lot of these um, women that you that you meet out there, you know, the pole dance, even the pole dancing is a part of it. The pole dancing was one of the practices that used to take place in many of these heathenish, non beta Israel cults. The same type of activities today. You understand? Even some of the dress that the women wear today now out in the world, out in the street, out in the club is very much similar. You understand? You're seeing all these piercings, other tattoos, so forth and so on. And I've seen some interesting tattoos on some of these women out there. Some of the tattoos are in Hebrew. Some of the tattoos are ancient Egyptian. You understand? And they actually say something. And you have to wonder, like, how is this project chick going to know about this? Unless You know what I mean? Uh, you, you, know, you know what I'm saying? You know, when they came and spelled the name right, but that you, yet they know what ancient Hebrew they know. Or they must be a part of certain practices. And lo and behold, this is what happened to, um, to the Beit Israel. The Balak could not curse could not have Balaam curse the Beit Israel, so he did the next best thing. He basically corrupted the integrity of the set apart people, directing his attack at the male. So he sent he sent his allies, women, the girls, you understand, to basically invite the Israelite men to this high place, this club. The club was named Baal Peor. This was the name of the club. It was in the cleft of the rock, I saw a very interesting um, painting. I don't know if it's from Tissot or another one of the the Christian artists, European Christian artists, but it was interesting because it actually looked like how the clubs would most likely look, in like in caves and clefts of the rock, you know, a cleft of the rock, basically. Because remember what Baal Peor means, um, uh, Be'ayel of Fagor, it means Lord of the Opening. And that opening has to do with a certain sexual ritual as well. I discussed this at a little bit of length in some of the teachings from the last uh, Torah portion um, that um, is an audio version right now, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to put it up there. But let's just move on right now, and then we'll try to try to uh, review what we didn't get to go into more details on. But um, So now they had an attack. Basically, Yahweh Jah told Moses, attack the Medianites. So, so they slew every man including five kings, these five kings of Median, as well as the prophet um, Bela'am in Numbers 31, 3 to 8. Now the Beit Israel, the Israelites, they burnt the Medianite towns. 
took the Medeanite woman and the children captive, seized all of their beasts and wealth as the booty. That's the booty that we was after. We seized all of their beasts, their wealth, their women, their children, and we slew all their men. And we brought the captives and the spoils to Musa, to Eli Azar, or El Ahayel Osar. And the Beit Israel community, the Mahibir, at the steeps or the steps, the slopes of Moab in Numbers 31, 9 to 12. Now, Musa, Moses, Moshe, he becomes angry with the Sarawites, um, the Tabaots, um commanders for sparing the woman. Moses, I think he, he was rightfully angry that um, we were supposed to slay the woman because the woman was the main spear of the campaign used to corrupt the the Beit Israel men, and they'll just like today in this present time, you understand is these heathenish. They may be black, they may be white, they may be Hispanic. It doesn't matter. They're heathenish women. They're serving false gods. They are part of these heathenish. You know the club, the 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 strip pole. You understand it was the pole of Asherah. You understand that that was the pole of the Astaroth. Don't you don't you know these things? You understand? So the same thing that was going on then, this is why these things are being popularized now. You think it's just, oh, that's just, look, they slide down the pole. Yeah, okay. Um, and <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll try to get into some of the comparisons between what's going on in the club today. You understand? What's going on out there in the club today, how that is a mirror image. As it says, what, what was happening as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. And this is exactly what's going on. So Moses was angry with Israel's army's commanders for sparing the woman, as they were the ones who, at Bela'am's bidding, at the bidding of Bela'am, had induced or seduced the Israelites, especially the Israelite males, the males of Israel, to trespass against Jah, to trespass against Yahweh in the Chatiyat, of Peor or Fegor in the Baal the Baal Peor incident. And this is in Numbers thirty one, fourteen to sixteen. Now Moses then told the Beta Israel to kill every boy of the Medeanites and every woman who had had sexual relations. So everybody who was sexting, you know, everybody who was who was who was creeping and and stuff like that. Everybody who had sexual relations were to be were to be killed, were to be put to the edge of the sword. Every boy, every male, and every woman who had sexual relations. Now, th- th- see, it's not that they, that they had sex because they fell in love. Well, they probably fell, but it wasn't in, in true love, you understand? It was because they had partook in sexual relations in a ritualistic spiritualistic way, right, um, which opened the door to demons from the duat, from the underworld, from the Seol, you understand, to have access, you understand, into this portal and to corrupt the Beta Israel and to corrupt the Israelites. This is like when we look at black folks. We look at black people's situation and we, we make one step forward and like it's like 25 or 22 steps back. You understand? But, even though these were killed, these and those were killed, the boys, every boy and every woman who had sexual relations were killed, the virgin girls were speared. The virgin girls were speared. The, the girls who did not know about all of this sexting and texting and, and you know what I mean, um, all the rest of these activities that are so popularized now and become like, you know, even now, you know, ones don't say they're a prostitute. They say that they are erotic instructor. They have these, you know, I'm, you know, a sexual janitor, some type of, you know, they have these sort of, these, these sort of freaky names where they make it like legitimate sounding names and everything like that. But please look into the connection between the sin of Baal Peor, what occurred at Fegor, Yovas, and what is occurring now. And how these heathenish temples, you understand, all these places where where we believe, like people say, oh yeah, they worship these false gods. But this is the club. It, it took place at a place that was so innocuous, seemingly, just like the club. They had things like strip poles. Because if you understand what the Ashtaroth, the Asherah worship was, 
It was a, a phallic object, and the strip pole is a phallic object. And the woman would give herself. She would actually be married to these demons, you know what I'm saying, through these symbols. You understand? And the tattoos also, if you, if you understand the connection. I know this might be upsetting some folks, but it is what it is. Now, there's a, there's a cleansing that's coming up after this battle that we want to touch on. There's a cleansing, and it's very important. Now, after the battle is over, there is the need to be cleansed from the bloodshed. Because this is real world. This is not, right now, we're studying this. This is the exercise. But there's real world. And in real world situation of battle, you understand, and, and, and bloodshed. There needs to be cleansing for spiritual, for psychological, and for physical purposes. And that's what we're going to take up in the next part of this 42nd um, uh, Kufale known as Negadoch or the Parashah that is called Matot. So stay tuned.